Conservative government. And against this background, why, you may ask, should any voter want to grant the Conservatives a fifth term? This is the question Labour should continually pose. The answer, of course, is that many people in the Labour Party are reluctant to face the reasons why. Mistrust of Labour runs very deep. It goes back to the 2008 banking crisis and the Tory success in blaming it on the Labour government. Then came the Ed Miliband leadership, which gave many of the voters the impression that he was ashamed of what Labour had achieved in its 13 years of government, but offered little clarity as to his alternative. Under Jeremy Corbyn, the public got to know eventually all too well what Jeremy Corbyn stood for. And at the last election, millions, millions of Labour voters refused uh, to back it. Uh, many voters say today say they don't know what Keir Starmer stands for, uh, and that's a problem for us, it is really. Uh, but frankly, it's a lot better than where we were with Corbyn, where they knew it all too well. Um, um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the 2017 general election result, in which Labour polled 40% of the vote, did lead some be to believe that a socialist transformation. For me, the Corbyn project was always problematic. Its central proposition was to build a British state far more extensive, more powerful, more directing of the economy uh, than we have today, in the belief that the, by these means, the great injustices which Corbyn and his supporters consistently railed against could successfully be addressed. What Corbyn offered was a national vision of left-wing populism uh, that I never thought feasible or for that matter desirable. It's important to emphasize that. Um, Corbyn saw himself as an internationalist, but without any clear conception of what that would mean in an ever more interdependent world. Um, Corbyn might somewhat have redeemed himself in my eyes had he vigorously defended Britain's membership of the European Union in the 2016 referendum. But he didn't for the simple reason that he never really believed in it or a united Europe. Um, Corbyn did have a global vision, but it was to view the United States as the source of most of the world's problems. When it came to highlighting global injustice, a key election, the public mood had shifted decisively. The public had grown weary of Parliament's inability to settle Brexit. In Boris Johnson, the Conservatives have a leader who promised to get Brexit done, and with a mythical land of milk and honey uh, that lay beyond uh, this achievement. He also claimed to be anti-austerity and pro-levelling up. His lies were believed with no credible opposition to challenge them. Disillusion with the Labour leadership with Corbyn had by then well and truly set in. His reaction to the Salisbury poisonings, you know, of the, of the Russian, uh, demonstrated a naive willingness to take Vladimir Putin as his words. And goodness knows what of that would have meant in the Ukraine crisis. Uh, Labour's failure to tackle anti-Semitism mired the, pan the party in scandal and disgrace. And the Corbyn was the dominant issue I canvassed on hundreds of working class doors uh, in the 2019 election, and uh, people just wouldn't have it. Labour duly crashed and burned, and in this context, the Starmer leadership was born. Now, Keir's first task has been to clean, clean out the Orgian stables of the Corbyn Labour Party, and I think in this he took his first big decision which is a very important one in politics. He would not prioritize maintaining the unity of the party as it was in 2019, above what needed to be done to get Labour in a position where it might win uh, the next election. Um, so what did he do? He secured an impressive majority on Labour's governing body, body, the National Executive. That was very important. The Shadow Cabinet has been completely reconstructed. 
with impressive new faces like Rachel Reeves and West Street and Richard Phillips uh, to the fore. Um, Anti-Semitism is being systematically rooted out and of the 100 plus Labour candidates so far selected by the constituencies uh, for winnable seats, only two are firm supporters of Jeremy Corbyn and Corbyn himself has been debarred as a Labour candidate at the next election. Now, in three years, the party and its culture have been transformed. Now, Starmer deserves, in my view, great credit for forcing through uh, these internal changes against a very difficult background. Because while he was trying to do it, Boris Johnson was very popular. He was seen as the deliverer of Brexit uh, and the deliverer of the COVID vaccine. Labour suffered the disastrous loss of Hartlepool by-election in May 2021. And had we gone on to lose a by-election in the Yorkshire constituency of Batley and Spen, uh, which came a month later, uh, Starmer's leadership would have come on to challenge. We managed to hold the seat by 300 votes, so it was as close as that. Um, and yet ignoring the pressure to prioritise party unity above all else, Starmer courageously then pressed ahead with rule changes at the September 2021 conference without any guarantee that he was going to win a majority, but he did. And the rule changes embodied the, year, the Equality and Human Rights Commission findings on anti-Semitism, strengthened the role of the National Party in parliamentary selections, bolstered the position of MPs in the election of the party leader and gave Labour MPs extra protection from the threat of factional deselection in their constituencies. So throughout all this turmoil, there was still considerable doubt over what Labour's strategy for electoral victory was to be. The 2019 result was a huge shock to the party. Could it ever win? Would it even survive? Now, those of you who work in proportional systems, 32%, uh, which is what we got in 2019, is quite a good result. In first past the post, it's an absolute <laughs> disaster. Uh, 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 and uh, we were 10% uh, behind uh, the Tories. Um, um, at no election for the last 90 years have fewer Labour MPs been elected to the Commons. To put it another way round, uh, to win an overall majority of one, an overall majority in the Commons of one, Labour must gain 127 seats at the next election, a feat which, is, which it, is, it has only achieved twice in its history, under Clem Attlee in 1945, and Tony Blair in 1997. Yeah. So, so what is the coalition of voters Labour should aim to build? Because in first past the politics, it's first past the post politics. It's all about building a uh, a broad ranging coalition. 2019 represented a revolution in Britain's electoral demography. Labour piled up huge votes in London, uh, the English, big English cities like Manchester and Birmingham, uh, the university towns, all based on a new electoral coalition of the progressive graduate middle class, uh, the younger precariat, students, and most ethnic minority voters. That's all to the good, but those type of seats are not enough, nowhere near enough, to take Labour to victory uh, next time. At first, the challenge facing Labour was framed, I believe, misleadingly, though not wrongly, but misleadingly, uh, in terms of winning back the so-called red wall of industrial seats in Northern and Midlands towns that Labour lost spectacularly for the first time in generations. These defeats in the once Labour strongholds of the declining industrial working class retain a mystical hold over, part, over the party. For many party members, Labour cannot be truly Labour 
without winning back its own working class uh, heartlands. Uh, yet the facts about these seats are not what they seem. Um, these constituencies tend to, be a, tend to a greater preponderance of older voters and pensioners, people who lack further and higher educational qualifications and disproportionately uh, supported Brexit. These people are often categorised as left behind or the losers from globalisation. Yet statistically, these are not the most deprived parts of Britain. Those are to be found in parts of London, uh, in the big cities, uh, and actually in some very neglected uh, seaside towns, which are very poor. Levels of owner-occupation owner in the seats we lost uh, are actually quite high. Uh, and also throughout the years of austerity since 2010, the electorates benefit from, benefited from the fact that conservative governments, successive conservative governments, protected pensioner benefits while cutting those for young families. And that's an absolutely key uh, uh, point um, about um, uh, about uh, uh, about what about how politics has worked in Britain in the last uh, thirteen years. And it's also true that. While the old industries that were the economic background of these co communities, such as mining, textiles, basic manufacturing, they've gone forever. Um, and we did, under New Labour, try to replace these lost industries. Um, but it had more success in cities than in towns. The growth of the knowledge and service economy was more successful in the cities. And the policy was too dependent on new public sector jobs that disappeared with austerity when the real challenge in these places is to foster new businesses, new enterprise uh, in these old industrial towns. Now, red wall voters do feel a sense of psychological loss. You know, I, I represent a, represented a, 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 a live in a red wall county in Cumberland uh, and represented a, a old industrial town called Wigton. And I understand how the tough manual male male <laughs> male manual jobs engendered feelings of social value, pride, and community solidarity, which have disappeared alongside the strong trade unions that used to represent uh, these workers. It's all gone, or very largely all gone. Um, nowadays, in these areas, children who do well at school go off to college. Uh, and often don't come back. Now, the trouble with all of this is we have to win back these seats, but nostalgia for a better past, uh, which is often symbolized by the decline of local shopping centers, is a very poor basis for a viable political project, in my view. Labour has always won elections when it's been seen as the party of the future, not looking back to a past that it's impossible for us to recreate. Um, um, uh, you know, take an example of this on shopping centres. I think the Johnson government has been pouring millions into shopping centres. I think much of this is money is going to be wasted. It won't result in... Uh, new sources of economic activity. Uh, uh, a better priority for social democrats is to recognize that shopping has fundamentally changed, the internet is here to stay, uh, and is to ensure that I think the new generation of delivery drivers and warehouse workers have better terms and conditions from the likes of Amazon uh, than they presently do. That should be uh, the labor uh, priority. Um, so um, I just, that's just an example, I think, of, of the problems of looking backwards. Um, now, the collapse of public faith in Boris Johnson and disappointment of the practical results of Brexit has done much of Labour's work for it in these areas. Um, but Labour's electoral strategy needs to be broader and more inclusive, and this fundamentally means gaining seats in the new town, suburban, and settled urban communities of southern England and parts uh, of the Midlands. 
um, Labour's target list now includes seaside resorts, which are quite prosperous, such as Bournemouth and Worthing. Um, um, but there's never been a Labour government in my lifetime when Labour hasn't won a string of North Kent constituencies uh, like Dartford, Chatham, Haversham, Dover. Similarly, Labour has always depended on winning seats in Hertfordshire in places like Watford, Hemel Hampstead, Stevenage, Wellin. Um, uh, yet in this type of seat, the Conservatives have built up huge majorities uh, since 2010. You're looking at majorities of 15 to 20,000 in some of these seats, uh, which is a lot in a, uh, in a constituency of 75,000 uh, um, So we have to win back uh, substantially in these areas. Now, there's a, a, a think tank I approve of called Labour Together, which has just produced a, 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 a report saying what Labour has to do is to win over Stevenage woman. Uh, Stevenage was a new town uh, north of London that, that took many people from the East End slums in the post-war era. One of the post-war Labour government's great achievements to build these new towns. Uh, but it's Stevenage woman rather than Workington man. Workington is a few miles from where I live up north. It's Stevenage woman rather than Workington man that, that holds the future. Actually, I get rather fed up with these rather trendy uh, categorizations of people. I think, it, I think it, the, 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 uh, it's very difficult to put people in categories, but uh, um, it does tell you something. And it, the, the key point is that we have to build a broad coalition uh, in the next few months, which may be sufficient to break the mold. Um, uh, whereas previously, people voted SNP because they saw it as a way of the best way of protesting against a UK Conservative government in a Westminster election. Um, now they can confidently vote Labour to remove it. And I think that we are in a different situation and we could secure 15, 20 Scottish seats, maybe more. Now, constructing a winning coalition is not just about demography and region. Political scientists today point to cultural divisions replacing class as the dominant factor in determining voter choice. Now, have to be cautious here. Uh, if class had been the fundamental factor in determining voter choice, Labour would have won every election since, two, uh, since 1918. And the fact is that millions of working class people have always voted Conservative. Uh, so um, that is one point. Um, uh, but what has declined, and I think this is significant for Labour, it's not the working class that's sort of defined, because I've thought there's a lot of sociological debate about what you mean by working class. What, what, what has declined uh, is the organised working class. The organised working class is what is what has in, been in great decline. Um, and that's because of the disappearance of the heavily unionized sectors of the economy, uh, which on which the labor movement uh, once uh, relied. And I, I say this often to labor audiences and they don't like it, but labor has struggled to come to terms with the collapse of laborism. Laborism is gone. Labour has to find a new basis uh, for its support. Brexit did prove a trigger for detaching a significant segment of white working class or white working class voters away from Labour. Now, uh, as a, someone who's spent most of my political life fighting for Europe in Britain, I'm afraid to say the vote on Brexit didn't come as much of a surprise to me. Um, support for Britain's EU membership was always fragile. It was always an elite project without a united British elite behind it. Um, 
And one of the paradoxical consequences, indeed, of the 2016 referendum campaign has been to create a pro-European constituency in the country of thousands of people who care about Europe that, that had never existed uh, before. Um, why was the referendum lost? I think I'd better say something about that. On the one hand, um, uh, I think it's true that both Labour and Conservative governments had hardly ever made a strong case for our membership of the European Union. The core of the Brexit identity argument, which is that Britain is at its strongest when it stands alone, and the 1940 is the kind of, you know, Churchill and 1940 were strongest when we stand alone, was never directly challenged by the British political parties. Um, and the argument for pooling sovereignty as the answer to problems of growing interdependence never properly made. Um, uh, the referendum came at a, a special point of vulnerability. Um, the Euro crisis has undermined the argument that Europe represented the hope of a brighter economic future. Uh, and the refugee crisis of 2015-16 heightened the profile of immigration as the key factor in determining how people voted for immigration and free movement. On the other hand, there was undoubtedly a broader element of alienation from the governing class that contributed to the Brexit vote. Um, uh, and I explain this like this, you know, in 1975, the fact that business overwhelmingly supported Britain's membership of the European Union on the grounds that it would be good for the economy, good for jobs, uh, that had quite a big influence on how people voted. But by 2016, I'm afraid public respect for the views of business uh, was in sharp uh, decline. We were living through an age of austerity, uh, the banking crisis, uh, uh, the price of it was paying, paid for by working people, while, of course, the, ba the bankers continued to do very well for themselves. Um, and I think the final factor, which, which again, I uh, um, think I'm obsessed with Corbyn, but I think I'm right to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Corbyn in 2016 had none of the appeal to traditional Labour voters that Harold Wilson had uh, in 1975. Harold Wilson was very important in the 75 referendum. Um, after 2019, Brexit became the great unmentionable, the great unmentionable in Labour's dialogue with the voters. Uh, Keir Starmer persuaded most Labour MPs to back the trade and cooperation agreement in December 2020 on the basis that the alternative was a disaster of no deal. Now, as a committed European who spent much of my life campaigning for Britain to be at the heart of Europe, I found all this excruciatingly difficult. But I do think it was right. Labour couldn't keep campaigning against a Brexit that was a fact of life. There was, and it still is in my view, no major public appetite to reopen what was the most divisive debate in Britain's post-war history. And that's why Keir and Rachel Reeves took the decision that not only was rejoin off Labour's agenda, but also Labour wouldn't contemplate halfway houses of the customs union and the single market. Now, these decisions are not going to change before the next general election. But, but, <laughs> Labour is becoming much more vocal in its criticism of Johnson's botched Brexit deal. And public opinion is certainly becoming more sceptical of whether Brexit has been worth all the hassle it has caused. Now, the first opportunity to seek major change in the Brexit deal will come immediately after the next British election and in the, after the, the next European elections and the next uh, commission, the next, uh, you know, the, 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 the shifting of the musical chairs in Brussels as well. Uh, there'll be a review of the trade and cooperation uh, agreement 
Now, um, Labour's put forward a sensible agenda for change in very general terms. The question will be whether any feasible adjustment to the trade and cooperation agreement will provide enough stimulus to growth uh, and business investment, given that we are actually in a very dire economic position, becoming more evident every day. Now, on this, radical change will become more difficult to secure if the Commission sticks to the doctrine that third countries cannot pick and choose which parts of the single market they wish to sign up for. Now, I know um, some of you may disagree with this statement that's coming, um, but in my view, Britain is not a third country. Uh, in Labour's hands, it will be a committed partner, ally and friend of Europe. It's not Brazil, it's not the Philippines, and the Commission has got to change its views. Right. Um, uh, and I'm putting that very starkly, because I think it's important in the Brussels uh, <laughs> um, uh, Because I do think we, that Labour, are, we will be active and committed pro-Europeans from where we are outside the European for, uh, Union. And it, examples of where this is necessary, both for the rest of Europe as for Britain, are, are uh, if we're going to uh, achieve our goals on energy and climate change, for instance, House will know uh, that uh, what happens in the North Sea requires uh, incredibly close cooperation between, um, in terms of building wind farms, uh, between Britain, the Netherlands, France, yeah. Belgium, Denmark, uh, incredibly close cooperation. Uh, it requires common uh, approach to investment, common electricity pricing systems, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so, so it's essential. And the other area where it's essential um, it is in, foreign policy, security, um, and defense procurement, I think, uh, which Ukraine makes compelling. Um, I think closer economic ties between Britain and the European Union are the consequence of the shared political challenges that Britain and the rest of Europe face. Now, behind Labour's caution on Europe li lies a bigger fear that Brexit has ushered in a new era of so-called cultural politics. And I want to say something about this. I think there are dangers for Labour here in over-interpreting this trend. Comparisons with Trump, between Britain and Trump, are, are particularly misleading, in my view. Um, uh, Johnson was more like Trump than anyone else. And no one can play the tunes of social nationalism as well as he once did, but he's not there now. And most British voters, whether they supported Brexit or not, are not fired up by US-style establishment conspiracies, religious fanaticism, extreme social conservatism. The national unity Britain showed through the COVID epidemic in supporting unprecedented restrictions on personal freedom or the unity of grief when Queen Elizabeth died, these things don't suggest to me a country that's permanently at war with itself like the United States is. Um, and polling suggests that by far the most important issues for voters are the cost of living and the state of public services, particularly the National Health Service. Now, the Conservatives clearly <coughs> believe that they can bolster their core support by playing to an agenda of social conservatism. Um, they are attempting to portray Labour as in the pockets of woke activists on issues like asylum, gender recognition, sex education in schools, a refusal on our part of, to, to acknowledge the alleged, and I stress alleged because the research actually shows it's not to be true, the alleged role of Pakistan, men of Pakistani heritage uh, in child abuse uh, gangs. Uh, and all these things are being played on by the, by the 
conservatives. Uh, Rishi Sunak clearly sees commitments to get tough on criminals and stop the boats of his asylum seekers as policy areas where political advantage uh, lies. I think Labour has to highlight the conservative responsibility for what we have, which is a broken criminal justice and asylum system. And that's why I don't get terribly excited about criticism of recent adverts that we've put out. Um, I see little evidence, though, that, that this will work for the Conservatives at a time when concerns about living standards and public services are so high. Um, while Labour must avoid self-inflicted goals, it's not evidently in the Conservative self-interest to drift into sounding like the nasty party. Theresa May warned them 20 years ago they were becoming the nasty party. And do they really want to go back to being that again? I think we should be more confident that our core values of fairness, justice, tolerance, within the respect and respect for the rule of law, these are touch, these are values that the British people share. Now, on policy more generally, Starmer is moving the party onto the centre ground. Um, now, a substantial section of the party, as it was in 2019, would have been content with a policy stance that amounted to Corbynism without Corbyn. Um, in his leadership campaign, uh, Keir did give some limited credence to this dream by including 10 left-wing sounding policy pledges in his manifesto. In my view, this was an unnecessary mistake and they will give, it will give some substance to Tory charges of flip-flopping. Um, but let's not get high and mighty about all of this. Um, I think that to win the leadership election in 2019, any candidate would have found it necessary to reflect the policy positions which party activists had come to accept as the norm uh, during the period of the previous incumbent. Uh, it would be easy for people like me to criticize, but we must recognize, I have to recognize, people from my side of the party have to recognize, that no candidate of ours would have been able to wrest the party from the Corbynist grip unless they had served in Corbyn's shadow cabinet, and that was Keir Starmer's strength. Since then, events have completely changed the policy and agenda Labour has to address. Completely changed. First, Britain has left the European Union. Post-Brexit, Britain faces huge economic challenges, a new strategy for economic growth, uh, from which every part of Britain can benefit has never been more urgent. Now, the Conservatives evidently don't have one. A free port or an investment zone, which would just divert investment from one part of the country to another. Um, uh, a bit of financial deregulation, which in my view carries as many risks as it does opportunities. Uh, and, uh, 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 and trade deals that honestly deliver less than 0.1% uh, additional growth, and that only after a decade. Uh, so the Tories have nothing to offer. We have to have a strategy for growth. Second, COVID both inspired us with the heroism of public service and exposed the tattered fa fabric of our society. It falls to Labour to renew and reform the NHS and social care and at the same time, bring back respect for the values of public service. So Labour has to be the great restorer, reformer, and reinvigorator of efficient, caring public services. It's a big, huge task. And thirdly, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Britain has, must come to terms with the harsh consequences of Putin's aggression which in my view change all our very comfortable post-1989 after the fall of Berlin Wall assumptions. Um, I think Joe Biden's been magnificent on Ukraine. Uh, NATO's been wonderful. But can we rely on it for the future? Can we rely on America in the future from Trump and his Republican copycats? Um, 
I think we face a huge challenge, and the challenge is European rearmament. And I know that isn't a popular thing to say on the left, but I think it will have to be done. Labour has been cautious about the commitments it's made, uh, especially to additional public spending. Specific pledges have been costed. The party goes to considerable lengths to demonstrate how well they'll be paid for. That's how politics works in Britain. Uh, today. Um, um, however, caution is not simply a matter of political prudence. It reflects the despairing realities of Britain's economic situation. The failure to grow the economy, the fact that since COVID in the, in, that since COVID in the G20, no country other than Russia has suffered a worse economic performance ensures that the post-election picture for the public finances will be truly dark. Um, for the post-election period, the present government, post-2024, post the present government is assuming that it, a fiscal tightening in which growth in public spending will be held back to 1% uh, a year in real terms. I just don't think this is sustainable. I don't think it's on. Uh, the government has made pledges to increase spending on childcare and defence, for which they've made no provision. The spending pressures from pensions and the NHS as a result of demographics are going to rise. Um, and also, you referred, Andreas, to the strikes. It's not feasible yet for very long to hold down public sector pay, the, yeah. the growth in private sector pay. It's just, if, you, if, you, if you do that for too long, you'll just destroy your public services completely. So I think the pressures on public spending are going to be very uh, great. And on public investment, um, Boris Johnson said he was going to have 3% of GDP public investment, which actually isn't that high by European standards. Uh, Sunak is now cutting that back to 2%. To 2 and the Conservatives are now signalling, you know, forget about investment, forget about social care, forget about the needs of public services, or the children from deprived backgrounds that fell behind at school because of, of, of COVID. Um, forget about the chaos. We can't even, you can't even get a passport in Britain without a wait for months. And months. <laughs> Absolute chaos in public services. Um, uh, forget the need of the needs of defense and, and Ukraine. Their top priority is to find money for tax cuts uh, as their last throw of the political dice. Now, I believe uh, Labour shouldn't be intimidated by this prospect. Um, it's a matter for careful political judgment how we respond to any Tory tax cuts. I think uh, we should criticise unfunded giveaways from the desperate position we're in. Um, uh, my instinct would be to support some tax relief for the lower paid, funded by closing some of the tax re reliefs the top taxpayers enjoy, uh, but I would make the argument that any more redu general reduction in tax would be dependent on the return to robust economic growth. Um, and Labour has to set out a plan for how to achieve this. Now, how? The two key principles, in my view, should be invest to grow and invest to save. Um, for invest to grow, Labour has already committed itself to a significant programme of investment in climate transition. Um, I could talk about that at some length, but in terms of the time, I'm not going to. Um, uh, uh, it, it will require uh, a lot of planning to make sure that it's done well. And at present, we are being, we're presenting an aspiration uh, to invest in new industries and climate transition without detailed plans, which I think will be necessary uh, to convince both the electorate and uh, the financial markets that any borrowing to fund this is not irresponsible. Uh, the other key
key principle, ending the calamity of a decade and a half of economic stagnation and broken public services <coughs> must be at the center of the labor program. Um, uh, but that's going to require big changes in the way government works. And this is what I'm going to end on. It's not more to go. <laughs> uh, first of all, the key principle of our investment programme has to be partnership with business. Um, the free market left to its own devices isn't going to provide the new industrial strengths that we need. But nor will an all-directing state. Um, and we have to work together in a partnership with business uh, to create, uh, uh, to, 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 to ensure that investment. I mean, classic example of this is, is uh, um, uh, you know, the speed of take up of electric cars depends on a plan for reliable and widely available charging points throughout the country. In Britain, there is no such plan. Maybe that in continental countries there are plans, such plans, but in Britain there is no such plan. So you need a mix of 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 private investment, private entrepreneurialism, and uh, public planning. Um, second, um, we must open ourselves up to new talent in government. Starmer's Britain needs to draw in the best ideas, the best thinkers, the best doers pioneers in the charitable and voluntary third sector, innovative and successful managers of public services, those from the private sector who combine strong social commitment with a generally entrepreneurial mindset. I really believe these people exist, and I really believe that we should be trying and working out how we're going to bring them into government. Now, this isn't anti-civil service. I'm not anti-civil service. A lot of Conservative ministers are very anti-civil service. Rather, we need to raise the morale and the capacity of public service if Britain is to achieve big change. And this does need an injection of new talent working alongside um, public service, uh, alongside civil service. Third, we need maximum devolution. I think somebody, there was a report I saw that said England was the England was the most successfully uh, was the most centrally governed country uh, in Europe, a country of fifty five million people, all run from effectively uh, from the centre, um, and the centralising and stifling grip of government departments and the Treasury needs to be released. Uh, we've talked about devolution for a long time. Gordon Brown set out a, a radical vision. Labour has said that it will introduce what it calls laughably a take back control bill uh, in, uh, uh, in its first term. These commitments are of high generality. If there has to, if there has to be, if there's to be action from day one of a Labour government, the details have got to be worked up now. Um, fourth, um, there has to be a determination across the whole of government to rebuild trust in our relations with the European Union and its member states. Lack of that trust has become a barrier to practical cooperation in pursuit of progress across multiple fields of endeavour. And that has to come back as a key theme of the Labour uh, government. Now, what does Starmer need to do? He's, he's been mocked for some of the things he said on policy. Um, I actually think the five missions he set for his government, which he set out in March, um, are all perfectly serious and sensible. And they'll give a medium term focus to his government in contrast to the inconsistency and policy failure of what we've seen under the Conservatives. Um, what Keir now needs to do is to give the electorate more of a feeling of what he's passionate to change about Britain. Um, and he does need to explain to sceptics what it is about him that makes him different to the Conservatives. In other words, what kind of social democrat he is. In both strategy and communications, there's still something lacking. Let me illustrate with a bit of potted history. 
Um, every time Labour's won an election in Britain, it's done so on the back of a recognisable governing principles. Um, in 1945, the Aki government was about public ownership and economic planning to prevent any return to mass unemployment uh, and to build a beverage welfare state. That was what the 45 government was about. In 1964, the Wilson government was about the modernisation of Britain by marrying science to socialism uh, and creating a new meritocracy based on equal opportunity that would sweep away the dominance of the public school over time. Um, the Wilson government of 74 emphasized social <coughs> partnership with the unions as the only means of maintaining social stability. The Blair government of 97 promised not to reverse everything that Thatcher had done but to build a new Britain on what she had neglected to do, which were principally public services, education, the NHS. Labour's strategy was to invest and grow with social justice and economic efficiency marching hand in hand. Now, what's going to be, how are people, what are people going to think about a Keir Starmer government? I think it's got to be something like this, and it's too, this is too long. The Starmer government will lead Britain's breakout from 13 years of economic stagnation, public service neglect, and political chaos. It will be an investment government uh, with a consistent and coherent plan for UK renewal, investment that's costed, affordable, and fully in keeping with the missions we've set out. We'll invest to grow, and we'll invest to save. Uh, and we then top-down government work in close partnership with business and devolve power and responsibility uh, to our nations, regions and communities as much as we can. And I know that isn't very satisfactory, it's far too long. Not, of course, a complete and satisfactory answer to the question. This is all work in progress, but there's a lot to do if Labour is to fight a convincing general election campaign and succeed in government. Um, we're not going to face situation in 97, where we came in and on the back of a growing economy, we were able uh, to expand living standards and improve public services, ensuring our re-election in both 2001 and 2005. We're unfortunately not on that rising tide. So we have to be a bold government that makes real change and demonstrates the kind of coherence of strategy to be a social democratic government, but inch by inch, as the famous Polish man said, tackles the hard boards of injustice uh, in our society. Uh, and that's the only way uh, Starmer can be more than the long term government. And my apologies for being on the Thank you. Thank you so much. It was um, not too long. I think we could have listened even longer. But you also throw some uh, bones uh, or sticks to, to take it up in the discussion. And uh, uh, Thais Reuten, which is our SD coordinator also for the relation with the United Kingdom, probably will take up uh, some of, of those. Maybe two or three. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Andreas. And um, thank you, uh, Baron Little, dear Roger. Uh, <laughs> He's that you it's barren. <laughs> that, was, that was a joke, but but um, but um, well, I I I have permit me a, a personal remark also on, on 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 being again as many times already in the past uh, year with uh, with uh, with you in the same room, Roger, because uh, um, I was reminded also by uh, by Seamus Jefferson about um, this visit of the newly or again elected uh, the the. Prime Minister Tony Blair visiting a campaign event on the last day before the election uh, in the Netherlands, and he was kept. It was kept secret that Tony Blair was coming, and that was the time of Wim Kok, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister, in uh, going uh, off for his second uh, second uh, uh, government. And uh, in this evening in Rotterdam, there was uh, there was uh, Tony Blair coming on the stage after this one of these historic. Uh, election uh, wins that that you uh, mentioned, uh, Roger. Uh, but also from that date, from these years, uh, dates my uh, um, relationship with uh, Labour and with uh, um, working for a uh, Labour MEP for a short uh, 
uh, internship. And that was also the time that I uh, looked up already to uh, one of these great thinkers that the labor, uh, the progressive movement uh, in, in Britain produced. And uh, uh, so it's a long time that I uh, have the pleasure to listen to, uh, to Roger's uh, visions. And again, today, we were not disappointed, I, uh, I may say so, because I think you outlined uh, very well and analytically also, as you are uh, able to do so, uh, so, um, so perfectly. So I want to thank also um, uh, you, but also uh, FEPS and the Renner Institute for convening this, because I think that these are exactly the exchanges we need, not just to learn and to hear more about what's going on in Britain, <laughs> but also to learn from each other. To maintain our strong ties, not to rebuild them, not to maintain them, because they are still there. Our UK friends may have left the Union, and many of whom, like yourself, unwillingly. But that's not where this story ends, the story of progressive uh, politics and of progressive cooperation. And I think we need to come uh, together on this, uh, like this, and exchange these uh, ideas and help each, others, uh, each other out. Not, not just because we are close in proximity, history or philosophy, not just because... Uh, Russia's war raging, the heart of Europe has refocused our minds, um, yeah, and, and, and not, not just for that, but because I find it so hard to believe that there would never in the future be a possibility for us to restore that terrible mistake. However, we also listened, visiting Britain to Keith Starman, he was very clear uh, to us, and uh, it's true that each of us in this room cannot wait for Sir Pierre uh, Starman to win the elections in a landslide. Uh, and uh, labor, ships, labor leadership has made a very clear decision not to focus on rejoining the EU in any shape uh, or form. Uh, and I think that that is the right strategy and the right uh, uh, choice. But that doesn't mean that there is nothing left to work on, to build on, to construct, to reconstruct. Um, and I see this, the great unmentionable uh, of Brexit, not as a full stop, but as a decision, a wise decision, um, uh, now in this uh, particular moment um, but I very very much appreciate and we all do here in the SD group uh, and uh, across our uh, sister party family the Labour's outreach recent outreach across the channel and I also see a big turning point which I witnessed I think visiting the La Liverpool uh, conference because that was when I think Pierre Starmer moved from being the leader of the opposition to the next prime minister, to the uh, person uh, that could have uh, uh, has the, uh, the, the team also, because we then after that in the last past couple of months, so many displays of labor shadow uh, uh, ministers taking the lead, taking the lead in debates about uh, the rearmament, the difficult discussion of rearmament, the necessity of cooperation on defense and foreign policy, which is close to my heart uh, as well. So I really very much appreciate and also on the themes that you've mentioned, the climate change, the energy cooperation, um, and as I said, the, the, the cooperation on foreign policy and uh, security. We see that here in Brussels and in our capitals, in the member states, and we look forward to work even closer to on these items. So let's look ahead for a bit. Also from my side, you know one thing for certain, in 2024, the British public will have more to choose from than the leadership wasteland presented by Johnson and Corbyn uh, in 2019. Because um, uh, I agree with, with a lot of your analysis um, uh, and vision, I won't repeat uh, all of the points that I, uh, I, I uh, wrote down here, but one I want to pick out, and that is the courageous choice, the courageous choice of Keir Starmer as you formulated it, not to prioritize unity of the party over a clear vision uh, and a course and a strategy uh, for Labour. I think that is one of these lessons that we as European Social Democratic parties can also learn from. Um, so I, I noted that uh, carefully. Um, uh, but, but going back to, to when uh, Sir Keir won the leadership contest, contest Labour needed reconstruction, as you said. And after a decade and a half of Tory rule, so does the UK. Uh, so do public services. I fully agree with, with you on that. And also in my country, the Netherlands, but I think in many European countries where we are not uh, in government, especially when, where we are not in government, you see an increasing situation of private wealth and public poverty. And that is, I think, 
uh, a, um, a, a very uh, important signal to all of us because that is unacceptable, obviously. And I appreciate also the outline you provided uh, of the, uh, well, the quadruple destruction after the 2019 uh, elections. Uh, and I would add to your uh, analysis last year's remarkable Tory implosion, which for a few months peeled away any semblance of competency, competency the party had retained throughout the years of Boris Bluster, and, and then the boon of another implosion in, in, in Scotland. And I fully agree on the necessity of Labour presenting a clear governing principle, a governing a vision of uh, 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 with, with a print under, underlying principle. Because right now, and, and, and I, will, I, will, I will now really look at the future, also at European future, in today's run-up to, uh, to a campaign, more than anything, it's a competition for competence. But if Sunak turns out to demonstrate a reasonable level of competence over the next year and manages to keep the willfully extremist guests some of his cabinet members in check. Labour's platform needs to be more than the promise of a stable investment government, as you also rightly pointed out. And we know that many people will swiftly vote against their own interests, also something you mentioned. Huh? Um, and we can, uh, well, we can be angry about that, but that is what's happening. Voting behaviour is emotional more often than deeply uh, rational. So very few ever benefited uh, from a, a decade and a half of Tory rule, fewer even from Brexit. But politics is not just about the plans. Nobody reads on the page election manifestos. It's about the psychology of feeling seen, feeling heard, feeling understood. And social democrats are, as a rule, excellent at crafting plans on what would be the right thing to do. But when we fail to present our case clearly, underpinned by these principles that you also um, uh, outlined uh, to us. Um, so outline how the conservative self-enrichment of the right directly affects the individual voter to demonstrate that we hear the concerns, that we hear uh, and we will always risk losing to those populists who are not afraid to capitalize on these sentiments if we don't do that. Um, and that doesn't mean that we have to step in to the trap of copying their cultural war core concerns, nor should we do the opposite and lend our unwavering support to the diametric opposite of whatever the cultural war concerns are. But we should make it very clear that they lied. They lied. So maybe if I can add one more principle to the uh, principles you outlined for a next um, Labour government, the, the, the upcoming Labour government, it would be that. Because more than anything, people, and thereby voters, hate being lied to by politicians. And that is exactly what the Tories do. They weaponize this very real sense of psychological loss to which you referred. Um, and, and Labour should take uh, that, uh, that on, uh, recognize that psychological loss, point out how the Tories lied to their own voters, and then present a competent Labour government that would never do that, lying to their own voters. Maybe Labour would also have disappointing messages at times, but we would never lie. Only when the problem is clear, then does competence come in as a solution. And to illustrate that, a quick detour to the Netherlands to end with two weeks ago, an upstart party called the Farmer Citizen Movement won a plurality of votes in every single of our 12 provinces. While known as the Farmer Party, they won votes all across the country, all across the country, from voters who felt acknowledged and respected. And let's not dwell on their platform, with which I mostly disagree very strongly, but they managed to capitalize on the voters' desire to feel acknowledged, not lectured to, feel acknowledged. And this is the challenge, I think, also for the next left, for us. Uh, as we are here together, but uh, with many more out, uh, outside uh, this room. And we must demonstrate that we do not only have a plan, but that we see, feel, and acknowledge individual voter concerns that necessitate that plan. And then we must repackage that into appealing action points, and with a clear vision of the future that's better for each uh, of our voters. So, to end, uh, Andreas, I want to uh, thank you, Roger, for your vision. Um, as always, also this morning, I learned a lot. And uh, I want to reiterate and say once again, 
how pleased we are with the um, with the consistent uh, uh, emphasis that uh, the labor uh, team is putting on the relationship uh, with us with Europe and we vividly remember also the visit only a day after we went to London for the parliamentary assembly of uh, of Stephen Dorty and then David Lammy and then John Healy um, and uh, we want to continue uh, these uh, these efforts together with you and as I said in the beginning some of the lessons presented to us by you but also by the period uh, that uh, I'm happy to say it in the beginning almost from the abyss uh, the electoral abyss to back to government um, we can learn also from that and I want to thank you again for for sharing these lessons with uh, with uh, with us and uh, looking forward to, uh, to what comes uh, next thank you Roger. thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you, Thais. Uh, I, I want to say we are around 50 persons in the room and online. And I want to say it's not only participation from the European Union, uh, also outside, of course, from the United Kingdom, but also until uh, uh, down under New Zealand. Uh, uh, we, we also welcome Grant Duncan uh, with us so far and also appreciating the time difference which he took. So I didn't, originally was planned to have one hour here and then uh, which, which was broadcast and one hour then internally. Anyway, we, we exploded our time.